Yo! How to write bad guys. At first pass on the subject, I think we can say that the idea of a bad guy is not always necessary. The shadow of competition does not need to be loaded with a kind of personified moralizing in every story. But it does make it easier when there is a bad guy. It makes it easier when there's a fountainhead or a nexus of antagonism in the form of a person that can then serve as the ultimate challenge in the final act of a story. The world is a challenging and difficult thing unto itself, but we like stories with bad guys. It makes things easier. And I suppose that might be because few things in the world are quite as challenging as other people. So, that's the subject then. The antagonist, the bad guy. What is their function in stories? And what is their best use? At first pass, there seem to be two types of bad guys. Bullies and villains. A bully is, well, a bully. The type of antagonism they produce is straightforward. They call the protagonist stupid or ugly, they demand lunch money or eat up the last of the plain cheese pizza for themselves. They thump and bop with palm and knuckle, they lash out with fist and boot, they rip and tear. That's the function of a bully in a story. The motivations are irrelevant. Perhaps the bully as a character is somehow overtaxed and unable to cope in any other way. The character may use the bully's aura as a shield to protect something unseen. Or, perhaps less nobly, the character of the bully really does derive joy inflicting something on others. The act of bullying may then be a form of honest self-expression for the ugly of spirit. I think it's said that one in six to one in three people are net malicious in some degree. Malicious in the sense that winning a game is fine, but it's more important that someone else is the loser. Even if it's something small, like a conversation. Someone else has to lose. Bullying can be a learned behavior, a defensive mode to protect one's own resources, like time and attention. But bullying can also be honest self-expression. But in the end, these motivations are irrelevant. We are trying to describe the function of bullies in story, so that then we can try to describe how best to treat these characters when we encounter them. And in this pursuit, it seems bullies are disinterested in the world. It's always about themselves, either protection or predation. Thus, the protagonist of a story can best a bully by not giving them what they want. The protagonist can make the act of bullying more costly than it's worth, often by simply standing up for themselves. A bold protagonist can make it clear that the bully is just as disinteresting to the protagonist as the rest of the world is to the bully. The bully is just another part of the world, an obstacle to be kicked over, a Goomba to be stomped. In many stories, this sort of reversal and mirroring is often portrayed as enough. Bullies either reform or retreat in the face of this. They join the Z fighters or are spirit bombed away. Thus, in stories, bullies teach the protagonist courage. At first pass, that seems like their best use. And so, we come to villains. The appearance and presentation of a villain can look identical to a bully, or wholly different. These superficial considerations of course have their place, but the substance we detect as an audience leaves the sensation of profound difference between these two types of bad guy. In talking the subject over with my wife, she helped to clarify the difference in the feeling. 
Bully's Feast, the Villain's Garden. For a bully, the moment of their bullying overshadows the past and future. The purpose of the bullying exists in the present moment. Even if there's some elaborate setup, if, say, there's some cruel prank that requires the slow cooking of some ingredients, the feast is the purpose. The bullying itself is the purpose. Evil for evil's sake. Villainy can look exactly the same. However, I suspect the past and future do not fade away. I suspect that the past and future both are imported into the present moment to justify an act of bullying in such a way that gives the action a mandate greater than itself, thus endowing that action with the purpose of villainy. In their mandatory monologue, it will be made to seem as if the past has yielded evil as a natural consequence, or the future has made evil some kind of necessity at the moment. I don't know if this is always true, and quite frankly, it's a secondary notion to what I think is the substance we recognize as villainy. But at first pass, it seemed important. A bully might not give a damn about the world, and a villain might know their place and purpose in the world beyond themselves. That idea may or may not be true in any given story, yet it does foreshadow the best use of a villain in story. Place and purpose allude to that quality that separates the villain from the bully. The villain does not end their assault against the protagonist with fist and boot. The type of antagonism they produce carries a purpose adapted to its place. And, as it must go in narrative drama, a villain will reveal the protagonist's most profound weakness by striking at it. Place and purpose are clarified like the twisting of a knife in such a manner that the villain challenges the protagonist's hopes. Not the hope for a victory, but the protagonist's hope that they might be the good guy in their own story. The villain suggests that the lesson of courage might merely be a lesson in becoming a bold bully unto themselves, an evolution inside the protagonist that they might not have noticed at first pass. Trampling a garden does not make a hero. Likewise, colorful fruits harvested and reduced into a sweet and saucy spectacle is not evidence of a good garden. In one way or another, the villain will ask, what has the protagonist been sustaining themselves on? What have their actions been? The substance we recognize as a villain is that which clarifies place and purpose. I once knew an ATC guy who told me the best part about dirt biking in the desert was that the sand would find the weakest part of your bike so that you could then get it replaced. I hate sand. Bullying seems momentary. The best use of a bully in story is to teach the lesson of courage to the protagonist. Villainy has a place and purpose beyond itself. The best use of a villain is to dispel the illusion that clouds what is truly good. The substance we recognize as the good guy more than the victor or the justified, but that quality that makes a character good in story must then be whatever survives the villain's assault. I think about those characters Mr. Glass and Rorschach sometimes. Be sure to fight, lament, and describe. Pieces.